Hello, everybody. I'm Dennis Shea. I'm organizer of the Bay Area Content Marketing Meetup. Thanks for being here or watching the video. Today, I, I've done a little bit of SEO in my day on B2B, so I'm really excited for today to learn about SEO for B2C brands. We have Steve Wiedemann here of Wiedemann Consult Consulting. Steve's going to talk about how two restaurant chains shifted SEO focus during and after the pandemic. Steve, I will hand things over to you. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. This is so awesome being able to hang out with you guys. And I know, I know you probably talk about SEO a lot. So I'm hoping I can share some stories and give you a little bit more context on how our approach has been. Um, I've been in search since the late 90s. I got out of the Army infantry and went right straight into digital marketing and IT and um, went back to school and got a degree in e-business management. I uh, worked for Disney Parks and Resorts Online for several years back in the 2000s, working with Disneyland Commerce, Disneyland Marketing and Adventures by Disney, a brand new brand for family travel to all sorts of really fun destinations. Um, I did the agency thing for a few years after my tour at Disney and decided, you know what, I, I think I'd rather be closer to home with my family, uh, pick up a few kind of freelance clients. That freelance client business turned into a whole business. Um, I found myself um, getting an office and incubating uh, agency SEO teams. I found myself working with some pretty exciting clients that were referred to me by other people that I'd, I'd done work for in the past. And by 2015, I incorporated and you know became Wiedemann Consulting Group. We're, we're currently working with some really exciting brands like uh, Applebee's and IHOP. We, we've also worked recently with uh, companies like Skechers, Public Storage. Uh, we won some awards uh, for work we did with Meineke Car Care Center. And um, got some really exciting stories to share. And I'm always, uh, after we get through this, I'm always available if you want to ask more questions or just uh, just kind of hear more of, of how, you know, we've, um, we've kind of grown in the whole world of multi-location search since the 2000s. So today we're going to talk about how we scale content. Um, and as a as a search engine nerd, I love to research and study things. Why are these sites ranking higher? What are all the links that I need to be getting that all the law firms have, or, you know, all the, in this case, maybe restaurants have, where, um, where do I need to be putting my, my most important keywords? Are they still important? Um, how do I organize my website? Like I'm always, I'm always looking for um, new ways to do better and to, to see pages grow in search results. So we're, we're performing studies, I feel like every month. We were just talking about voice search a little earlier, and we did some work on, on the voice search side to see what the differences were between people who were searching from their phone versus a uh, an actual assistant device or from a laptop. Uh, we recently did a study on over 300 different local pages and 101 of those were food and dining related uh, in part to help some of our clients uh, on the restaurant chain side, but also in part to feed our, our desire to learn about what makes a high ranking local page. If you've got multiple brick and mortar locations, Let's say you've got a few hundred of them, um, you know, or you're Bernie, you've got 375 of them. How do you how do you make them all unique and helpful so that Google doesn't think that they're all duplicate of the same thing? And we've heard Google, John Mueller and Gary Isles tell businesses, stop creating tons of local pages that are all duplicate. That's not helpful, but they still work. Right? So we're not going to stop doing them because we're getting traffic. But what we can do is we can make them better. We can make them more helpful. We can make them more unique. And I'm going to share some ways that we did that with Applebee's and IHOP as we go along. So let's keep going. So here's me. Uh, I mentioned my, a little bit of my history. Uh, in the 2000s, I was SEO Steve. I am teaching at UC San Diego, Cal State Fullerton, and Fullerton Community College. Um, fortunately, not all at the exact same time, but there's times where there are some overlaps. It's only about an hour uh, a day for me to be on those office hours, so it's not killing me. I'm also the author of SEO Strategies and Skills, a new textbook through Stukent. So if you are taking a, uh, a college program or a certificate program for digital marketing and they use Stukent, you'll likely see my little textbook. Um, I'm also, as I mentioned, a big junkie of researching algorithm changes. I'm leading a team of nine here in La Mirada, California. And I am the lead consultant right now for both Applebee's and IHOP. So let's jump into it. 
So what the heck is local SEO? And I know a lot of you who have been in this group have already explored different areas of local SEO. And, and what I encourage you to do is as you're learning more about localized search is you break it into categories, break it into um, if you're if you have a notebook set up or you're using Evernote, you know, create a, a notebook for each of these different areas. The first is going to be the business data accuracy. If Google can't figure out that your business is at one, two, three, five, and not one, two, five, three, um, then they might not decide to display you because they might feel like, hey, this this result I can't verify that it's it's really at this address. So I'm going to show one that's verified, and almost in many ways is like the nucleus of you know the local SEO um, cell, if you will. Um, I'll talk about some ways that you can scale that as well beyond just local pages. Improving the helpfulness of local pages. So this is the one thing that we're going to talk the most about as we get into it with the examples and the story of, of what we did during the pandemic. And then improving off-page visibility. So in the local side of things, it's, it's really about making sure your business information is being found more often. So as Google and, and Bing Bot are crawling through the, the internet, every month they're finding more instances of your business information and, and using that to infer that you're getting more popular and that you're still open. If they don't find anything about your business for several months, they might start to assume maybe this place is closed. No one's talking about them. Uh, and then last is search behavior signals. So if, if you know our, our data is on point, our landing pages look really good, and we're getting visibility off our website, but we've got a one-star review, nobody's going to click on us. And over time, Google might infer that we weren't a very helpful result because nobody's clicking on us. So we want to make sure that we're paying attention to those areas. So really quickly, again, before I get into some of the on-page, I want to walk through a little bit of those other three areas. They're important, and you know we've, we've got a lot of experience with this, so I thought I'd share. Platforms are worth it. <laughs> They're absolutely worth it. I know they feel expensive. I know they are expensive. But when we look at the scheme of things and, and the, the management of the business data, the scaling of it, and some of the other features that these platforms come with, it makes your life so much easier. If you want some recommendations on, on which ones are right for you, feel free to reach out to me. And um, we did a, a pretty comprehensive study of all of the, the data management platforms and have some really good insights. What do they do, right? Well, most of them will make sure that they manage the information in the databases that web directories use. Data Axel, Newstar, Foursquare, um, these have changed over the years. You know, We used to have Axiom, uh, Factual got gobbled up by Foursquare, and Info USA is now Data Axle. So there was a correlation in the rankings when we did some initial tests. Uh, we had a multi-location brand that really wasn't doing anything online, and um, this is a burger restaurant. And so we we started by just getting their business data into these databases. And over the next several months, we saw correlation in keyword rankings. We weren't doing anything with on-page yet. We were still putting the strategy together and the wireframes and the, you know, what we wanted to do with the new website. So there was an absolute correlation between making sure your business information is correct and managed with, you know, what we call data aggregators. Here's the alternative. You don't want to, you know, do it through a platform. You don't get the bulk price savings. You know, each of those platforms are about $50 per location. So you can do the math there. If you've got a few hundred locations that can get really expensive, they will give you some bulk pricing, but not nearly at the scale of you know, the ones that have hundreds of thousands of locations and get a huge discount on the savings for inclusion in those databases. Single source of, of truth. I, I suppose if you have Salesforce or another CRM, you could call that a single source of truth, but then you'd have to make sure that all of those platforms are APIing to your Salesforce to get that data, which can be not so fun, right? Um, you can manually manage with your team of three who are managing a thousand locations, all of the different placements in the aggregators, in the navigation engines like Apple and TomTom, Tom, um, in the search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo, et cetera, and then the local social sites, Yelp, TripAdvisor, and Nextdoor. So you could say, you know, hey team, I need you to manually manage all of these different um, uh, submission destinations across all of our thousands of locations, ready, go, you know? So what's that resource cost you? What does a trained digital marketer cost you? To me, it feels like a huge cost savings to use a platform. Um, and then there's auto field conversion. Each different destination has different fields in the spreadsheet. And every month you've got to convert your data into their format to submit all the changes and ads and removals. 
that's fun. Use a platform, it's all done automatically. Um, and then analytics, can you analyze how many of, of those different placements are, are showing up as accurate right now? Of the directories that buy that data, how many of them are using it and it's correct? How many duplicates do we have, right? Without, without using a platform, there's not really a way to know that. Uh, and the last is what could cost you a lot of money in the Google Maps API fees, because these, these uh, platforms do offer Google Maps services, it could save you a ton of money on what you would pay to, uh, to Google Maps. So that's the alternative and why I would use that. Next one is off page. On the off page side of things, this, this is where you have to get creative. If you're a local multi-location brand, you've got multiple locations, how do I scale I'm trying to get other websites to link to me, to get them to mention me. Here's an example of an attorney at several locations and it's, it's Daryl Isaacs, the hammer, right? He's, he was on some rapper's song recently, uh, Jack Harlow, I think, right? And um, this is a client we've, we've worked with since 2016. And we had this challenge. How do we get other websites to mention our business data? Yeah, we're in all the law directories, right? Uh, we're in Avo and Justia and, and lawyers.com and you know all, all of those different um, important lawyer directories, but so are our competitors. Um, we're also in all the general directories, so are our competitors. <laughs> so how do we stand out? How do we get our business information more prominent? We do it locally by working with the community and, and the local area with neighboring businesses. So we started by doing local events and it worked exactly how we hoped it would. So we got our, our neighbors involved. It's a, it's a great way to, to sort of make them feel guilty to give you a link and a reference because the first thing you're gonna ask them is do you wanna contribute time or money into helping us? Nope, we don't have money and we don't have time. Um, we're under resourced like the rest of the world. Um, well, no problem. Will you at least maybe mention the event on the website? Sure, we'll do that for you. And boom, you get yourself a, a citation from a local business in your area and a site that gets traffic, not just some random directory that nobody uses. Um, and um, and of course, you get that link back to the website. So it's a great way to do that. And so the CPR class was one way. We also did a blood drive. We did this really fun helmet giveaway for safety. So scaling this, you go with, go to each location and say, hey, we're, we're going to come up with a budget or a, a game plan so that every location can do one of five different types of events. And let us know which one you decide to do and when it's going to be. Because when you do, what we can do is on your local page, we can add some markup that's going to help you to stand out. And I'll show you more of that here in a minute. So is it possible to, to scale off-page SEO locally? Absolutely. And the easiest way to do that once you've gone through that whole um, aggregator and search engine and navigation engine and social local uh, is to you know, do events. All right, search behavior, last piece before we jump into the story. Search behavior is whether somebody actually clicks on your results or not. You can't just shove your keyword in there and say, all right, I should rank now because the user who's doing the search is gonna see your keyword shoved in your title and go, yeah, that's not really attractive. I think I'm gonna click on the one that stands out. And there was that example we gave you a minute ago with the event, we can actually put some markup on the page to have an extra link show up. So now we don't just have four rows, we have five, well, six if you count the space. So there's a lot more we can be doing with markup and I'll show you some examples as we continue along. along. But that's our goal. Every month we wanna look at making sure that we're improving the accuracy of our business data. We wanna make sure that we're improving how visible we are off our website. And we wanna be improving how users are clicking on our results, which you can measure through Google Search Console. Here's some things you can test. I promise I give you a few of them. Here's a list of them. Local business first, and maybe even a, a sub item of local business based on the industry that you're in. FAQ page. We did this podcast with the senior strategist, SEO uh, analyst at TripAdvisor, and they told us that they were they were marking up everything. If you wanna watch that episode, it's, it's, uh, it's here. And they said, yeah, we're trying to mark up every single page on TripAdvisor because we know we get, at the time, four extra rows beneath our listing with the questions and answers. It's down to two right now, but still, that goes from four to six uh, rows that you have in a search results, more real estate, and you stand out. Um, ratings get you the stars. So now you have more color in the search results and the user's eyes will gravitate to it. Um, so here's that example, by the way, of the FAQ you can see over here for just some random attorney. There's the event, we talked about that a second ago, video objects, so you get a little video thumbnail in the mobile search results next to your listing, same thing for image object. You can try emojis, 
emojis work in titles, but they're not appropriate for every industry. For attorneys, it didn't work. Um, for, for industries where we're, we're doing things really more upper funnel uh, and drawing them in to build our audience for, say, an advertising website, emojis are a great way to draw their attention and get them to click, and you can use them in titles. They won't always propagate, but it's worth a shot. So one thing we always recommend, these are title tag principles, and uh, title tag principles are including the keyword you want to rank for, of course, some kind of a call to action, buy, purchase, order, download, get, uh, register, uh, and then a value proposition. Give them a reason to want to click your results. Uh, up here, you could see that title tag principles example, and we gave them the reason. The reason is they don't, they don't care about title tag principles. They care about improving their click-through rates and SEO. Figure out what their end desire is. What is it you really want? Um, and then you know, create that value proposition based on what their need is, not necessarily just the, the keyword. All right, so now we'll get into the, the uh, part that gets into our study, and then we'll, we'll segue into um, you know, what we did with the uh, pandemic and Applebee's and IHOP. How's everyone doing? Are we still hanging in there? Can I get, can I get some thumbs? Are we, uh, are we looking good? Some, yay? Doing good, doing good. All right, cool. We'll keep going. So on-page SEO signals. This was something we were really curious about. Why is this listing ranking number one in the, the maps? Why is this, this local page showing up higher than mine? Uh, 101 different food and dining chains. We took the big ones, the McDonald's, the Starbucks, the Taco Bells. We took all the big brands that we could find that were doing well um, in search where there's hopefully hundreds, if not thousands of locations. We looked at the website attributes at a site level. Were they auto-detecting location uh, for the user? Um, were they using SSL certificates? We went to the city pages. If they had multiple locations in a the city, they offered a city level page or a CLP. And we studied the CLPs. And lastly, we, we studied the location and store pages. And that's what got us really excited because there were more store pages than city pages since a lot of franchises only have one location in a city. So this was what we based our, our study off of. The, the primary data comes specifically from the actual location page, the brick and mortar store page. And this chart, you can screenshot it. I'll give you the presentation after the fact to play with. Pause the video if you want to. Um, the number one thing was hyperlocal content. Hey, is your boss telling you that you need to quantify why you need to put hyperlocal content on your page? Tell them, well, boss, the study happened recently by these nerds in La Mirada that proved that we'd have 107% competitive advantage if we use hyperlocal content. There's your data. There's your arsenal. There's your armor to protect yourself against the naysaying stakeholders in your company. Number two was the location photos. This is hard for some locations. Some locations aren't in great neighborhoods and you might be intimidated to take a picture and put it online. So there might be some Photoshop in your future, you know, to, to maybe exaggerate a bit of what the visual appeal of your, your location is. But inside, I'm sure your location's amazing. You know, I'm sure the, the front door can, can look amazing too without showing the whole building. There's lots of things that you can do to show location photos. Uh, next is a Google Map embed. People are just accustomed to Google Map. They trust it. Um, Apple Maps had some quirks over the years. More people are trusting it again, but for a while they were really bad. So a lot of people trust Google Maps and Google trusts itself, of course. A 360 tour will give people a nice inside view and even an outside view of your location so they can virtually put themselves there and look around and say, is this somewhere I really want to go visit? Um, next is local uh, location specific social profiles. So for every location, you probably have a Facebook page set up, even if you have it closed for comments. You probably have a Foursquare profile. You probably have a Yelp profile for every single one of your locations. Provide links to those. It, it reconfirms to the search engines that those social sites are about you because they link to you and you link to them. Now you've confirmed that's, you know, that's part of your brand and it does show and help prove the data accuracy and that that local page is what they should be showing in the search results. Um, really cool way also for users to interact with you on social media. A directions button. If you having a local page and not having a directions button is crazy, but the poor user is gonna have to like press and hold the address and then press and hold and, you know, paste it into their, their map program. Don't make them do that. Just have the directions button. The open now status is really helpful for users. Without it, you're creating friction. They have to look, think, and, and calculate in their brains. Instead, just put open now. Um, and then native reviews, nobody's doing this. So competitive advantage opportunity. 
Uh, and location hours, obviously kind of a no-brainer. Oh, there's a link to the study down here too, if you wanna check it out. It's gonna look a little bit different next week when we launch our new website. Well, hopefully next week, I've been saying that for six weeks. Um, so uh, this is something I, I'm showing you a few of, of the different attributes, ones that I thought were the most interesting. This one in particular, uh, Rock and Bruce was the only one we saw doing this. So if you want to really stand out, get some first party native reviews from your local pages for that location. And again, none of your competitors are doing this and you'll have content about your products and about your services and everything that users are giving to your page so that you don't have to handwrite a thousand local pages. The users will do it for you through their native review. And because you're doing the intake on your page, you can gate those reviews to whatever extent you want to. Is it ethical? That's up to you, right? How much you want to gate and how much you want to let go. Uh, but it gives you the opportunity to make sure that you're only showing what you want your customers to see. Um, and if you give them cues, tell us about your experience. Right? You only want two fields. One is give us a one to five, right? And on the stars. Um, and then the second field is give us a review. Your, your help cue above that, that field should be Tell us whether you ordered takeout or delivery, because there's a lot of takeout near me and delivery near me queries being made. Tell us about the food you had. Tell us about, um, you know, the ambiance. Share your experience so that other people who come to visit us um, can see that. The more words they use, you know, because of the help tips that you give them, the more relevant it makes your page to those search terms. So native reviews are huge and nobody's doing it. It seems like, you know, and, and I know it's hard to manage and moderate, but it's not rocket science. You can outsource and create some guidelines and do it. I already mentioned so structured Steve, markup. Oh, go ahead, question. Steve, the um, just to confirm the term native means it's sourced and published on your own website. Is that right? Correct. Yep, okay. it's not third-party ratings, not your Google My Business or Yelp. Right? In fact, Yelp has rules about it and Google wants you to share all of it, but they already have that content in their database and they're not going to count that content on your page as being unique and helpful. The, the, okay. the users might find it helpful and it might help your dwell time a little bit, but the search engines don't like third party reviews on your page because it's just duplicate. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question. So markup, we talked about that a bit. Um, super helpful. And uh, again, hardly anyone's doing it other than the basic local business schema. They get directions and having that, um, that Google map on there, 16% competitive advantage for doing this. Um, and you'll see it on the diagram I'll share, share with you in a few minutes. <clears throat> I really like BJ's model. If um, if you've ever eaten at BJ's, one, you use, use the app, right? If you want to, or use the website and you can get on their little wait list before you get there. <clears throat> you can order while you're waiting, <laughs> right? And then when you sit down, you can order. And, and so, so they have the ability now to track you from the keyword you searched to the amount you spent through the app because you're doing everything through your phone. Talk about attribution modeling and being able to quantify what you're doing from online to offline. I love that, it's so huge. And there's other ways to do it, but they did such a great job of it. And they also had location images where a lot of competitors didn't. It's hard to get those images. You have to pay photographers to go in and, and do it um, as a phase two, as a phase one, at least get someone with an iPhone to take some pictures. But um, Huge competitive advantage there. Supportive content. So I, I might have mentioned earlier that I won a, a, a recognition back in 2014 by, by Placeable. Uh, what we did that was unique in, in the work we did with the agency that, that we teamed up with uh, was that we created all of these sub pages for each location. So instead of it just being Meineke Anaheim, uh, we had oil change Anaheim, we had muffler Anaheim, we had, you know, every every major service someone would look for, we had a page for. We even had a page for jobs. If somebody's looking for a, a, a car technician or auto technician job near me, we had a page for that so that we could get, you know, new hires and use, um, use that as a way to attract links. <clears throat> Our research, none of them had this. Not a single one. So if you're competing against a competitor, they have one page and you have a section of pages, who's gonna be more helpful? Here's that attribution example. I had to take this off of uh, a site that didn't do this at the local level because I was trying to find an example of it because not a single one was doing this. I'd mentioned BJ's doing with their tracking with the app, 
which I thought was great. And it's really cool that they have the ability to do that, but nobody was doing QR barcoding. So there's, there's something to test, get some QR barcoding done that's specific to that location. And I know it can be done because I was, I was out yesterday with my wife at um, a little restaurant in downtown Disney. And we sat down and we scanned the code on the table and the code actually told them not only, you know, that, that it was, um, or gave us the menu, but it told the servers what table we were at that we ordered from because we used that QR code to scan with. Really genius way to, um, you know, to, to keep track of everything attribution-wise, whether you're, you're tracking a table or tracking dollars spent based on a keyword that was searched. Um, Previous yes. slide, were those uh, organic or paid? For which one? Just before this, where you had the multiple searches for oil change and reviews. Oh yeah, these are all service. organic. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, yeah, feel free to replicate these. I think they're still exactly the same. I took this like a month ago. Yep. We even have the reviews one, you see that? So if someone were searching for Meineke reviews, we're gonna get hopefully top credit for it over Yelp and other ones because we're the brand. All right, keep going down. So this, this was something else that made a difference. It helped keep people on the page. It kept them from going back to the search engines and choosing a different result. 84% of our visitors, especially in restaurant, are coming from mobile devices. So why make them flip through the page to find out where they can place their order? Keep it sticky right there at the bottom. When we did this um, you know, with, with IHOP, we got an email from, from Jeff, our, our contact over there. They had a $2 million weekend. It's like, hey, could you put something together? This is amazing. We had such a great, you know, uh, weekend. What what'd you do different? We we added a button and we made it sticky so the person could navigate through an experience with their thumb and not have to use two hands, not have to fill out anything on a keyboard or even autofill. They could just click, 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 and be done. I'm not going to go through all these, but these are all the different areas that we studied. You can screenshot it right now if you want to, um, but you'll have this presentation later. You can play with it. Here's what we came up with as our little infographic of what we feel is the anatomy of a perfectly well-designed um, local landing page. All the elements here, you can see um, you know, the, the business name, the name, address, phone number information. Uh, we've got the custom images. We've got the Google map, the links to social. We even put a little download contact info file. So a little KML file, as well as the open now status by bolding it. Um, breadcrumbs here at the top for, for SEO. As you continue going down, we've got our video that hopefully can be unique to that page and give someone an example of the experiences that people have at that location. There's plenty of them on, on Google My Business if you look. Um, some unique content here. And as you continue going down, here's our native review area. Leave a review, right? Punch in your info. Really, you only need two fields, but the designer put a bunch in there, whatever. Two fields, the star, and then the review. Um, punch and submit, it goes into a moderation queue, someone will review it and approve it, and then it instantly gets um, thrown right onto your page as an example from the clients who visited your website. Down here you have your menu or your services specific to that location, and then you've got more hyper local content here. How do you scale that? That's a tough one, right? How do you scale um, yeah, across that many locations? You can start by creating a survey. And I know this is tough because everyone's busy and there's no time to fill out a survey, but you can send a survey and ask questions. What's the nearest stadium? What's the nearest uh, park to us? What's the nearest college or university? Um, who are the sports teams? Right? Get, get all sorts of hyperlocal information then you can thread it in. Well, how is, an, how is Angel Stadium and California Angels or what do they call them these days? Anaheim Angels of Los Angeles or who knows? You can tell I don't do sports. <laughs> and so um, how, how do they tie into a restaurant? Well, you could say something like going to see an angel game at uh, Angel Stadium and looking for a place to eat before you go or after, you can tie it in. So there's, there's, there's two ways to do it. The first way is dynamic. You, you go and you get all that unique information. You create 20, 30 unique fields, and then you create dynamic content and inject it in um, where it makes the most sense. Hey, um, going to watch a game at, right? And there's a blank space for the, the data to go in. The second way is the manual writing of content unique to that particular location. And you can go into the history of it. You can call the location and just chit chat with the manager for a few minutes and get a lot of really good insights about the location and the area and the people and the 
and the way that they look at things, the way they do things. And you can take all of that language and put it into custom content. I know that's hard to scale. Maybe it'll take you five years to do it. But in five years, when your page has that kind of hyper-local handwritten content, you're going to kill it. So it might take some time, queue it up, chip away at it. And I guarantee you're going to see some amazing results. So here's our deliverables from, from this study. Um, you know, uh, from, again, just from the data we, we found, choosing the right data management platform, uh, scheduling those, those tests that you want to do based on the attributes we discussed, um, scheduling those, uh, those cool local events so we get that extra markup and, and boost our, our off-page SEO, uh, and then search behavioral testing. So this is testing our titles, testing different schema and markup. Those are your takeaways from today. Now I'll tell my story and, um, you know, we can, we can kind of keep going. Uh, but any questions on this before I get into the Applebee's IHOP uh, pandemic case? Does it, is this helpful in terms of, of understanding those four areas of search and, and um, you know, what attributes might play a role in helping boost your rankings in Maps and Organic? Yes, hopefully. I see some quick, quick, quick question about the IHOP uh, case study. Yeah. Uh, what was their average weekend revenue? Um, it's a good question. I don't remember. I have to go back and look. But it was weekends are obviously a lot more than weekdays. Always Sundays are. Yeah, it's day. two million. Two million. I'm sure it was. It was great. I just. I was just wondering what was the increase <laughs> in comparison to to their average. Very cool. I wonder also in relation to when you were asking about finding information about each local uh, location. My mm -hmm. experience, and this is a long time ago, is that. Yeah the ease or difficulty of that depends a lot on the relationship with corporate, right? If corporate owns it or if they're individually owned and they, those people operating those locations have more or less skin in the game talking to you. But you, I don't know if you found that. Oh yeah. yeah, we have to do it all at corporate. We, we try to do everything and anything we can at the corporate level so at the local level, they can just run their business. That's our goal. Uh, I've got a cheat sheet that I can share with you after the call that that goes through three different areas uh, that we we give them a little kind of uh, cue card for the the folks in, in the desks in the back of the restaurant. And the top part is here's what corporate is doing for you. Data management, local page optimization, uh, data visibility by getting you in all these different directories. And we're helping manage and, and mitigate reputation stuff with, with ratings and reviews. You don't need to worry about those areas. We got you covered. Here are some areas um, that we don't want you doing. Don't create a rogue website. We don't need multiple websites out there confusing users in terms of where they need to go. Don't buy reviews. Don't ask for Yelp reviews. We don't need to get sued by Yelp for asking for reviews. Say people love us on Yelp. Give them all the cues that they need to make sure that they're avoiding things because some smart kid is going to walk in and say, hey, I can get you more traffic to your, or more, more, uh, uh, you know, walk-in traffic, um, foot traffic is what we're calling it. more foot traffic. Just let me do your local SEO stuff for you. And then they go and do a bunch of spammy things that work against us instead of with us. So we make that very clear, but then we don't want to restrict them or make them feel constrained. So we say, here's some things that you can do to help, right? Get driving directions from each direction on each different platform, Apple and Google. Is, is it accurate? Is it, is it um, uh, could it be improved? What can we do to make sure that your, your actual location information and directions are more accurate? Can we fix the pin? What, what can we do to help make sure it's, it's better? Um, making sure we are uh, doing some contests in-house to, to get people to leave reviews. Like mention me by name. My name's, you know, Clara, right? Or whatever. And have the, the hostess, you know, use that to try to, um, to do a little internal contest about who can get the better and more ratings and reviews. So there's lots of little things that we, we've suggested in that document. In fact, that part is the biggest part of the document, the cheat sheet. So if every restaurant had that, they wouldn't have to worry about um, working against corporate, but corporate should be responsible for all of it. And it is scalable. We do need some input here and there from, you know, from the location, if we can get it, if we can't, then we get a data entry person who sits there and does the research themselves to come up with the fields that are going to be in that dynamic content as the phase one. All right, let's keep going. So how did we solve for pandemic lockdowns? This was a scary time. And you know, uh, this is, I borrowed this from South Park, so hopefully I don't get in trouble. <laughs> but um, it was a scary time. Restaurants, dining rooms were closing. We had several challenges that we were faced with. 
Uh, people were stuck at home. They couldn't go to restaurants. And even if they could, the dining rooms were completely closed. You couldn't get in. They had a surplus of food. Food was coming in based on what they were used to having. And there's this deficit of customers. There's no customers. Um, and of course, getting difficulty with the, with the stakeholders. It was, it was a, a nightmare for corporations to be convinced that there's opportunity to still make money even though people are locked in their homes. And that opportunity is off premises. It's delivery, it's takeout, carry out, curbside, to go, right? It's all the different ways that people are searching for food um, and having it delivered to them or, or swinging by and picking it up themselves. So let's keep going. Uh, so our priority number one, when, when the pandemic started was we need to find where the opportunities are. Uh, we were actually furloughed for three months and we wouldn't let them furlough us. We said, nope, we're gonna keep working for you. And if we don't get paid for it, that's fine. We're not gonna let our client go down. We're gonna keep these kitchen lights on. We're gonna do it. So, you know, our, our team, we had another, enough accounts that we could, you know, maintain and be okay. So we, we took the 90 days and really did some, some damage. Starting with Google Trends, we noticed that there was a major spike in keywords like delivery and to go and take out. And uh, we were really exploring uh, as much as we could about um, uh, you know, our competitors and about words that people were using. Where are the trends and how can we apply them? We did some keyword research. And this was a little bit difficult because Google's Keyword Planner, that's the basis of most keyword data that you get from any platform, right? Um, only shows you, you know, the, the last few months. So when this started, we really couldn't look at the previous months yet. We had to wait a week or two before we could look to see what the demand was. And then, then we had to not use the average keyword search volume. We had to use the previous months because the average was significantly lower because the previous month we were on lockdown. So we used that data and we started to, to find search terms that we knew were important to us. For this example, IHOP, right? Breakfast delivery, super important keyword to them. Um, and then we saw some semantics and derivatives and, and similar search terms that we could thread into a potential content plan. Priority number two, now that we've, we've done our research, we need to get stakeholder buy-in. We need to go to the digital marketing manager and say, there's opportunity. And here's what we think that opportunity looks like and what we're missing out on by not doing it. So from that keyword research, we, we did some math and we figured out there's over 4 million searches per month happening for delivery, food delivery, breakfast delivery, meal delivery. Um, we stayed away from the meal on wheel kind of keywords. We were really focused in on more broader search terms. So it's 4 million searches. Based on our search console data, it looks like we're getting less than 100,000 of, of the visits that could be coming to our website from those 4 million, uh, probably because we don't have any delivery content. <laughs> um, competitors included the delivery services. So when we when we got really good at, at this content strategy, we, we stopped looking at... Oh, sorry. So we, we stopped looking at Chili's. We stopped looking at Denny's. We stopped looking at those competitors. And we started using the actual delivery services, the Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, and Postmates. And you can see over time, we were actually able to beat Uber Eats and Postmates um, for some of those, those search queries. So we went back to the stakeholders and we said, um, hey, we think that there's an additional $2 million or more. It's always two, isn't it? It's weird. Um, $2 million or more in potential revenue. We, we think that based on the fact that we're only getting 100,000 of the potential 4 million that are out there. So we came up with a conservative number um, and we were able to convince the business to start creating some sub pages on their location pages. So that was priority number three. Now let's create the content. We know what search terms we need to go after. We've got buy-in to be able to create content to support an initiative to address off-premises. Let's start with the delivery page. And so we use delivery in the URL under each location, every single one, you can do a search for any IHOP in your area um, and, and you'll find the delivery page, especially if you do IHOP delivery in your city, you'll see the specific URL up here. We emphasized the most important keyword in the title, the secondary keywords and headings and in subheadings. We tried to use the best call to actions to, to make sure no matter where they were on mobile or on desktop, that they knew what to do when they were there, including that floating button. And then we used unique imagery 
that was made specifically for the brand, not a stock image where Google's already map, mapped the binary code of the image, but an actual image that IHOP came up with. Same for Applebee. You'll find the same pages across both brands. They're owned by Dine Brands, the parent company. Takeout, exact same thing. The only difference is the URL change from you know delivery to takeout. And the pictures are all pictures of takeout and what it would look like and what the experience is. And the foods, we, uh, the food terms we use included, you know, takeout near you, you know, like takeout near me. Um, we've also got uh, curbside in here. We've got order takeout um, uh, on your first online order. And then we have uh, food and, um, and other words that were from that keyword research folded in to the title, into the metadata and into the page copy itself. And then we made sure that Google could actually crawl to these pages. They were orphaned for the first week and we went nuts and we're like, Google can't find these pages. Sure, we can feed them through an XML sitemap, but they're not finding these pages by crawling and passing page rank from the home page to the city page to the property page and then to our takeout and delivery. We need Googlebot and Bingbot to be able to crawl and, and pass page rank to these pages. So we made sure that those links were there. So you can see those on the primary page. These are two links pointing to the takeout and delivery pages. And then we watched. After a few weeks, we started to see our listings appear. This is Breakfast Delivery La Habra, California. I think it's number three. I just folded it down so you could see who, who we're actually beating. Yeah, we're beating DoorDash and Uber Eats and Postmates for um, breakfast delivery in La Habra and a subset of derivatives as well. Takeout, breakfast takeout, same thing. Um, you can see our takeout sub page underneath the location page uh, appearing above Black Bear, above restaurant G, whatever that one is. I've seen that a few times and haven't even checked it out yet. And above Grubhub. And then here's what it might look like if you look for just a specific branded location. And this is what I was excited about when I finally saw everything start to mature and the dust settle. Um, now, we aren't competing with a page. We're competing with a section. So we have multiple pages competing against our competitors' single page. So we're crushing them in almost every case around off-premises. Here's our primary page, and here are our two sub-pages for this specific location. Love that. It was so exciting to see it actually come to work. Speaking of coming to work, so lately, the biggest challenge isn't uh, around getting butts and chairs, right? The challenge is getting people to feed those butts in the chairs because nobody's going back to work. Uh, one of our clients is in the um, procurement industry with software that they created. And we're, as part of it, we did a, a, a study of why people aren't going back to work. 43% of the ones that said they weren't going back to work said they're still undecided, meaning they haven't run out of money yet. <laughs> so some of them might go back. Others said um, that, that they were going back to school. They started their own home business. They um, had kids and decided they wanted to stay home with their, their kids. Um, but I thought it was really interesting that 43% said, um, you know, that they, um, you know, they were undecided. Yeah, there were a couple folks in there that said, screw them, because that's why, or it's all a conspiracy and whatever. But for the most part, you know, the, the feedback was really helpful. So let's help, let's help fill some positions. Uh, obviously, we wanted jobs in the URL. They wouldn't let us do that because the branding was around careers, IHOP careers and whatever. They wouldn't let us put it in the URL, but we were able to get it into the copy. And um, we were able to fold in a lot of the, the jobs and careers and specific types of jobs, server jobs, busser jobs, um, manager jobs, all of the jobs that are uh, available in a restaurant. Uh, were used in the copy itself, sometimes in headings and subheadings, and other times folded into the, the paragraph content. Um, and we were able to pull it off. We're actually, now if you do a search for restaurant jobs in, in an area where there's a physical location, we're in general, we're on the first page of Google now for every single location, uh, bringing in new employees, hopefully to help alleviate the, the folks that are struggling as, as hostess is trying to, you know, and servers trying to help all these people. Um, now they're going to get some help, we hope anyway. Um, we also made sure that the words we wanted to rank for were used in the anchor text. Restaurant jobs in La Habra was the link on the primary local page so that Google would interpret that anchor text and now probably use it as a, a title if it doesn't like our title um, and use it to rank our website with. In the same way we did with George W. Bush in the early 
late 2000s with the miserable failure um, Google bomb that we did. If you want to research a fun thing that happened in the SEO world, 200 webmasters got together, linked to the the biography page of George Bush on the Gov site with the phrase miserable failure and his page ranked number one. It was an exploit of the importance of keywords and links. Um, number four, we want to track the results. So after all of this, after proving that we, we had an opportunity, doing our keyword research, putting that content together, rolling it out, testing it, now we want to measure the results and show the stakeholders that this worked. And this is data I can show because you know anyone can run an SEM rush report, right? So SEM rush, you can see how we were kind of nowhere, you know, August of last year. And as we continue to chip away and improve these pages, um, you know, we just started dominating. We were uh, we're on the the tipping edge now of beating Postmates um, for restaurant delivery queries. For this is for Applebee's for a very broad, very competitive keyword. We still have a ways to go. I've deselected Grubhub and DoorDash because they're still miles ahead of us. And I wanted to zoom in a bit more to show you how we're you know, continuously creeping up month over month because organic is a marathon, not a sprint. And then we went, you know, when we, we looked at the keywords themselves, you can see that the, the competitive um, you know, opportunity here is watching Postmates drop on many of their keywords as we take their market share for delivery in all of the different cities that we have a physical location. For IHOP, even easier because there's less breakfast restaurants than just restaurants all around. So in, in this case, you can see IHOP was um, didn't exist for breakfast delivery queries because we didn't have content for it. IHOP is now the number one, uh, has the number one visibility in search results where they have a location, not always nearby, but in the city they have a location, um, they're always above all of the delivery service providers. So it worked. We did exactly what we wanted to do. Um, this, this chart is definitely um, not as fun as the one where we compared against Denny's and Cracker Barrel because in that one, the blue line was up here and everyone else was flat line at the bottom because they weren't doing this. So the delivery services are the more appropriate competitors and they're not even real direct competitors and they sell for us. Um, so dominate mode, right? So here you can see we're just crushing it from August of last year. Um, where we didn't exist at all in rankings. And now we are on the first page, uh, in many cases, in the first position of the search results for those non-branded search terms. What did it mean? You know, overall, I took a subset of a subset, so I wasn't sharing too much private data. Um, here you can see a couple takeout page examples. Google Organic started. Uh, we actually launched the pages in, in September of, of 2020. And you can see how that growth has happened over time. Um, tapers off a little bit right here. This is just because we don't have a complete week. And this is set by weeks, not by days. So if you were to look at a complete week, it would be probably right around here. Um, but, uh, but this shows you know, how organic is a slow growth thing. And it has worked exactly how we hoped it would. So those key takeaways, as I, I mentioned earlier, they're here um, from, from this particular um, exercise, if, if you were to work with your team, here's what you would say. Guys, every month, girls, guys, um, let's make sure that we're improving our data accuracy, our local landing page, SEO, our data visibility, and our ratings reviews every month. Show me what you did to improve these areas every month. Even if it's just a little thing, show me we did something. Uh, two is you know looking at trends, exploring Google Trends and looking for keyword ideas. I think this is a great way for you to augment your existing strategy with what's in demand right now. Um, right now, there's still people looking for family meals and feasts. It's still happening, especially during the holidays when people are doing more ordering online and their families are home for the holidays. So thinking about that. Um, think silos like we did with Meineke and we did with delivery and takeout and careers, the sub pages underneath those primary local pages. Start creating content underneath those local pages. Um, and then monitor, monitor and measure those results. I like KPIs. I have a KPI tracker in Google Sheets and in Smart Sheets that I use, um, depending on the client and which one they like. And every month that we record the, the technical scores, we record um, our keyword uh, market share and, and visibility, our average position. We record organic traffic and organic sales. And then every month we, we see how it goes. And at the end of this KPI tracker, we have what our goal is for the year. And we have a second column that says, what percentage there are we 
um, or what number there are we in terms of, of hitting that goal and what percentage are we toward actually making it. So I could say in this month, hey, we're 55% um, near where we need to be to hit our KPIs for the, for the year. Great, that's good to know. Nobody does that. And it's just a stupid Google sheet, so easy to do. And that was my presentation on scaling local search. And thank you for giving me a chance to share some fun stories and talk to you about SEO. I'm happy to answer questions and just kind of hang out with you guys. Thanks so much, Steve. I think we have time for a question or two. Does anyone have questions? I see Alejandro is unmuted. Uh, yes, if no one else has one. Um, yes, Steven, I thought it was interesting what you were trying to push jobs instead of careers as far as obviously they already have the careers page uh -huh. but was that was that because obviously when you're thinking about a restaurant job you're thinking about restaurant job not a restaurant career per se or or was that based on oh, the volume, search volume that you did? Yeah. i don't know the volume. You search for i'm looking for a uh, a career in, in busing i'm looking for a career in um in uh being a bartender right well maybe exactly bartender, yeah but, yeah, so more, more people are looking for jobs. So the, the search volume, if you use the Google Keyword Planner, yeah. um, it's like night and day. People look for jobs, not for careers, especially with like restaurants, jobs. No one's looking for dishwasher career, right? So, uh, but we all start Makes somewhere. Sense. I start. I started throwing newspapers and picking up trash at theme parks when I was 17. So we all start somewhere. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I'm not, I come from the restaurant industry for a long time too. So yeah, definitely, oh. but makes sense. Right on. Well, cool. Well, I hope this was valuable. I was hoping to get more questions, but I know it's end of the day, and I you probably fire host you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's a lot no, of content. No worries at all, Steve. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to uh, soak it all in. I'm, I, it's so wonderful that you're so generous in sharing all of your um, tactics and successes. So thank you for that. That's how we grow together. This this community yeah. in digital marketing. Every business needs digital marketing. There's plenty of business for all of us. I just, I encourage everyone, be, be transparent, share, help each other. You know, one, one day, you, you never know what's going to happen. I, I, I always looked up to, you know, my, my friend, Eric Ward, who passed away a few years ago, um, was, you know, Link Moses. And um, we would share all the time. We'd jump on, on Skype and we'd share stories. And I was like, dude, you're doing so amazing. I'm so proud of you. And hey, let's get this call to action on your site so that more people subscribe to your Link Moses newsletter. And uh, and one day, just by helping each other, one day out of nowhere, I get a call and he says, hey, how'd you like to work with the third largest uh, real estate website? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, it's a little out of what I want to do. And they want more technical SEO than, than link building. So I'll make an intro and boom, you've, you've got the third largest real estate client now. I'm like, wow. And then I became friends with the people who run that account and we hang out at conferences and it's, it's just an amazing community of people who are open and transparent and helping each other. So yeah, I love it. Talking about conferences, Dennis, are you going to content marketing world? Yes, I am. I'll be there in Cleveland. Are you going? See you there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Cleveland. What's awesome. in Cleveland? Anyone Cleveland. else is, is going? Cleveland is the, is the home of content marketing world. This is the 10th tenth, tenth year, 10th tenth year. Okay. If, yeah, if you guys haven't gone, it's it's a lot of fun and it's a great community. So, cool. Hey, maybe we'll check it out. I had um, one of our our team members was down at the um, conversion and traffic and conversion conference this week, and then I have uh, Hansel and Johnny, I believe, are going to Locology uh, next week in LA. So, maybe we'll see. Hey, I'm getting a question. You you put up your Twitter handle SEO Steve. How else can folks get in touch with you? Um, I'm SEO Steve everywhere. Um, okay. You can email me too. I'm just steve at Um okay. I also have a little uh, SEO uh, Slack group. If you want to join those other SEOs that are on there, if you want to hang out with us on Slack and ask other SEOs questions, not just me. But if, if you want to ask the team questions and I'm not getting back to you right away, use the handle Wiedemann. Um, There's three people on the team that that monitor that those accounts on Instagram, on Twitter. Um, so feel free to hit us up. We, you know, we're not looking to take on a lot of new accounts right now. So whatever free help we can give you, um, you're not going to be sold anything. We just want to help. Excellent. We may ask for I think we have time for one more question. Anyone? Uh, Steven, Anyone? real fast if I can. Yeah. Um, hey, great presentation. I Thanks love your much. name, Alfie. That's so cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just short for Alfredo. It's just kind of shorthand. <laughs> Thanks awesome. for that. Um, I was going to ask, actually, um, you had mentioned a cheat sheet uh, earlier. You had said that there was like uh, ideas like an internal contest. Um, so employees can, uh, you know, uh, have their name mentioned in reviews. 
I was going to ask about that, the cheat sheet, but also um, you'd mentioned something kind of interesting. You said about 200 SEO people uh, were trying to prove the importance of keywords and something have to do with Bush. I didn't quite catch that. Yeah. Did so it was, called, it was called um, Google bombing and it happened during George W. Bush's presidency and webmasters basically said, hey, we all have these websites. Let's put a link to the George Bush biography page on you know, um, what was it, us.gov or whatever it was, right? And um, let's use the text miserable failure explicitly, right? Not click here, not visit site, not George Bush, but miserable failure. So when Google crawls that link and reads the text, that they'll infer that the place that we're going to, sort of like a sign above the door, um, is going to be about that keyword. And so they uh, essentially Google bombed him with over 200 links to that gov page with the text miserable failure and sure enough george bush ranked number one at the time for miserable failure when you look at his web page there's no titles descriptions headings or anything on the page that said miserable failure so the only reason it ranked was because google used those external signals its page rank algorithm is based on links to help decide what that um uh, what the most popular and and relevant listing would be regardless of what it found on the page and it's still today? ranks. <laughs> it, I don't Google know, miserable that, failure I don't today, and it's, it's it probably has the crazy. stories of it, ranks? but I don't know that it actually ranks. But here, let me give you that yeah, local fine. cheat sheet while I got, have you. Let me put that into the uh, the chat for you. That's awesome. Uh, Thanks for going over that. Yeah, the yeah. page doesn't rank, but the uh, the story about it does rank. Yeah, so it doesn't it doesn't work anymore because Google's come up with all sorts of new algorithm updates. So here, make sure you guys get that okay. Um, all sorts of new algorithm updates. The, the Google Penguin update in particular, and I think it was in April of 2012, um, was uh, was created to basically prevent uh, people from using links to, to game search results. So not only will they algorithmically penalize, penalize you, uh, but they may impose a manual action on that page, which is a hell of a lot of cleanup work to, to fix. So I would suggest not doing explicit anchor text as a keyword strategy or as a ranking strategy anymore if somebody does it organically or naturally sure why not but but if you do it and it leaves a digital footprint you're going to get flagged your competitors are looking at your backlinks and they're going to report you night and day for buying links so um so i would i would avoid anything that feels like you're trying to game the search results and focus in on those principles we talked about earlier yeah did you guys get the link thanks for that yeah we got the link okay cool all right steve yeah. thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us and joining us today and thanks everyone for attending thanks everyone thank you Bye -bye.